Okay, number theory. 28 class. 28 class is a term. So this is for the final exam review or any other questions you might have. Anything you would like me to do? Professor. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we can start maybe reviewing from 12 down because I think from 1 to 11 is just a, the review from the last exam. So okay. maybe you could do 12. Number 12 is to find all primes for which three is a quadratic residue. Okay. That's a very good problem. I think you use quadratic reciprocity law in here, right? Yes. Find all primes P such that, of course, we're only looking at odd primes for two, it's not very interesting. Find all odd primes P for which three is a quadratic residue. That means the Legendre symbol has the value one. So of course, three is congruent to three mod four. So if you want to apply quadratic reciprocity, it, there are two cases depending on whether P is congruent to one mod four or three mod four. So case one, P congruent to one mod four. And case two is when P is congruent to three mod four. So let's look at these two cases. So if P is one mod four, three over P, is the same as P over three. And <clears throat> what is this equal to? It's one if P is congruent to one mod three, and it's minus one if P is congruent to two mod three, right? Because one is a quadratic residue mod three and two is not a quadratic residue mod three. <clears throat> so if P is congruent to one mod four and P is congruent to one mod three, so three over P, just from this, this is one if P is congruent to one mod 12. Because if P is one mod four and one mod three, it's one mod 12. <clears throat> If P is one mod four and two mod three, so what is it mod 12? It's either one or five or nine. And so if P is congruent to five mod 12, all right? <clears throat> so if you wanted to solve the pair of congruences, P congruent to one mod four and two mod three by the Chinese remainder theorem, that's exactly one congruence class mod 12, and it is the congruence class five mod 12, because this is one mod four and two mod three. <clears throat> so that's the first case when P is one mod four. If P is three mod four, then both primes are three mod four. So the quadratic reciprocity law says that three over P is minus P over three. And this is equal to what? If P is congruent to one mod three, this is one, so this is minus one. And if P is two mod three, then this is minus one, so minus that is plus one. So, <clears throat> Again, three over P is equal to one or minus one. So if P is three mod four and one mod three, that's congruent to what mod 12? Congruent to seven. Oops, sorry, minus one. So if P is one mod three, like seven and three mod four like seven, then P is three over P is minus one. If P is three mod four and two mod three, what is that congruence class 
mod 12. It's exactly the congruence class of 11 because 11 is two mod three and 11 is three mod four. So when you put these two together, we get the following three over P it's either one or minus one. It's one if P is congruent to one or 11 mod 12. And it's minus one if P is congruent to five or seven mod 12, which is the same as plus or minus five mod 12. So this is the final answer. Professor, yeah, sorry. Yeah. what about if we are looking uh, for if negative, I mean, all prime, all prime P for which negative three is quadratic residue instead of three? I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you were saying. Can you repeat that, please? I mean, the same question, but negative three instead of three. Right. Well, okay, before I do that, let me ask if there are any questions about this. Okay. All right. So this is a standard way you apply the quadratic reciprocity law to solve a question like given some number A, find all the primes for which A is a quadratic residue and find all the primes for which A is not a quadratic residue. Okay, so then you asked about minus three. Is that your question? Yes. So you want to find Find all primes P, not equal to two or three, of course, such that minus three is a quadratic residue mod P. So again, we can start by dividing this up into two cases. So case one, if P is congruent to one mod four, then minus three over P, this is the Depending. same as minus one times three over P. And so by the multiplicativity of the Legendre symbol, this is minus one over P times three over P. And of course, if P is one mod four, minus one over P is plus one. So this is three over P. And for primes, congruent to one mod four, we already solved that problem. If P is one mod four, three over P is one if P is one and minus one if P is five. Mod 12. So if P is one or minus one, if P is one mod 12, this is one. If P is five mod 12, this is minus one. And case two is the case when P is congruent to three mod four. So minus three over P, which is minus one over P times three over P. If P is three mod four, this is minus one. So this is minus three over P. And when is this one and when is it minus one? So this is one when three over P is minus one. Three over P is minus one. What do we get in that case? When P is seven. Mod 12. So if it's minus one P is seven mod 12, 
This is plus one if P is congruent to seven mod 12, because when P is seven mod 12, this is minus one, so minus that is plus one. And this is negative when three over P is positive, which is when P is congruent to 11 mod 12. So if we put all this together, minus three over P is equal to one. If P is congruent to one or seven mod 12, and minus one, if P is congruent to five or 11 mod 12. And this is not necessary, but you might notice this is exactly the same as one. If P is congruent to one mod six and minus one if P is congruent to five mod six. <clears throat> of course, the congruence class is mod 12 for a number that's one mod six or one and seven. And mod 12, if P is five mod six, then P is five or 11 mod 12. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> Other questions you would like me to do? Yeah, we can continue with like 13. The, the, the same before with five, five over P. Okay. So this is problem number 13. <clears throat> Find all primes P not equal to two or five, such that five over P is one. Five is the quadratic residue mod P. So <clears throat> for this problem, there's only one case because five is congruent to one mod four. So five over P, no matter what P is, this is the same as P over five. And what are the quadratic residues mod five? One or four mod five. And the quadratic non residues are two or three mod five. So five is a quadratic residue mod P, if and only if P is one or four mod five or plus or minus one mod five. That's it. Okay. Nice. Can can we also do like fourteen? Uh, it says that prove that nine is a pseudo prime. Okay. But but if you could also, I don't know if there's another problem for Carmichael numbers, but if you could also like add the Carmel, like what is a Carmichael number and like the proof. Um, should be a problem for that too. Let me see. Yeah, okay, we, so. We could do 14, do yeah. So let's look at number 14. So let's recall that, um, let me just use the same notation that I used in the book. So we say that N is a pseudo prime to base B if B and N are relatively prime and 
b to the power n minus one is congruent to one mod n. So nine is a pseudo prime to base eight if eight, so in this case, n is equal to nine, so n minus one is eight, a to the eight is congruent to one mod nine. So how do we prove this congruence holds? Well, one way, of course, is to actually do the calculation. That's kind of um, let's see. I'm curious. What is two to the eighth? Is that thirty-two two hundred and fifty-six? Yeah, um, eight, two to the eighth. So I'm just, I'm trying to avoid having to do a long calculation. I could take eight to the eighth power. I mean, there are different things I can do, but uh, if I took two to the eighth, just 256, if you divide that by nine, what do you get? Uh, if you look at what is this is congruent to mod nine, right? Can someone tell me? One second, Professor. Four. Four. So eight to the eighth is two cubed to the eighth, which is the same as two to the eighth cubed, right? And if I'm interested in this, just mod nine, two to the eighth is four. So this is congruent to four cubed. Let's see, four cubed is 64 and 64 is congruent to one mod nine. So eight to the eighth is congruent to one mod nine and I'm done. So any way you do this calculation, you just have to s determine whether this number is congruent to one mod nine. So actually, here's an Professor. even easier way. Professor. Yeah. Let me ask you something because I thought like you needed to also prove the same for the factors of N. So I was a little bit- No, 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 no. This is for a pseudo prime. This is not for a Carmichael number. Oh, the other things for Carmichael. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So you can also say the following. Eight is congruent to minus one mod nine. So eight to the eighth is congruent to minus one to the eighth is congruent to plus one mod nine. That's another proof. This has to be the shortest proof there is. Let me do number 39. That looks complicated. Prove that nine, 1,905 is a 
pseudo prime to base two. Of course, this is not a prime, it's divisible by five. But to prove it's a, so must show that two to the power 1904 is congruent to one mod 1905. So one method is um, is to take this exponent, 1904, and write it in binary. So write 1904 in binary as is a sum of powers of two. So let's see, what are the powers of two? 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 5, 12, 10, 24. That's the largest power of two, less than 1,904. And the difference is 780, is that right? Uh, or 880 rather, excuse me. 1904 is 1024 plus 880. All right. Uh-huh, okay. And 880 is 512 plus 368. Does that look okay? All right. So that's 1024 plus 512. This is 256 plus 112. Correct. So this is 1024 plus 512 plus 256 plus 64 plus 48. And that's 1024 plus 512 plus 256 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16. So now we have, this is a sum of powers of two. This is two to the fourth plus two to the fifth plus two to the sixth plus two to the eighth plus two to the ninth plus two to the 10th. Okay. So again, you have to check my arithmetic, but let's hope that that's okay. So now, we want to start calculating two to powers of two mod 1905. So of course, two to the fourth is congruent to two to the fourth. Everything is mod 1905. In fact, all of these numbers, um, Hmm. Let's see. So two to the 1904 is two to this sum. So that's two to the two to the fourth, two to the two to the fifth, two to the two to the sixth, two to the two to the eighth, two to the two to the ninth, two to the two to the 10th, right? Okay, now let's try and make this a little bit nice. So it's actually equal to that. So it's congruent to that mod 1905. Let me make a little table if I can. So two to the first power is congruent to two. Everything is mod 1905. Two squared is congruent to four. Two to the two to the two is two to the two 
squared. That's 16. Two to the two cubed is two to the two squared squared. That's 16 squared. That's 256. Two to the two to the fourth is two to the two cubed squared. Let's see, 256, this is, what is this? This is two to the eighth. So this is two to the eighth squared. And this is two to the 16th. Two to the two to the fifth is two to the 16th squared which is two to the 32nd. Hmm. Yeah, I guess there's, I don't see any way not to have to do a lot of calculations, so. So two to the two cubed is two to the eighth is 256 mod 1905. Two to the two to the fourth is two to the two cubed squared. So that's 256 squared and And that's 65,536. Right, whatever it is, then you have you actually have to calculate it and reduce it mod 1905. Yeah, that would be 766. 700. Professor, quick question. Yeah. If we have a big number like this and the test, are we allowed to use technology to find things like this? Yes. Okay. So two to the two to the fifth is two to the two to the fourth squared. So that's 766 squared. And again, you have to reduce it. So you just have to do calculations. There are one, two, three, four more calculations and you need to use a computer or a calculator because the numbers are just too big to do by hand. You just calculate these numbers they're not too big for a computer when you're reducing the mod 1905. If you try two to the two to the 10th, that might be pretty big, but, um, but you're reducing yeah. it every step. So you'll calculate these numbers, multiply them out, reduce it mod 1905 and see that you get a one. The, 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 this one is nicer. This one is six, uh, 16 when you take the model. This guy? Yeah, that's 16. Okay, so then two to two to the sixth is 16 squared, which is 256 again. Oh, now it's gonna cycle. So two to the two to the seventh will be 256 squared, which you said is 766. And two to the two to the eight will be 766 squared, which you said is 16. And two to the two to the ninth will be 16 squared, which is 256. And two to the two to the tenth will be two hundred and fifty-six squared, which is seven sixty-six. So we get yes. this is seven sixty-six times sixteen times two fifty-six times sixteen times two fifty-six times seven sixty-six, and you multi you use your calculator or your computer to multiply them together and reduce them mod nineteen o five. But you can be fairly confident that I'm not going to give a problem on the final exam that requires this much calculation. It's useful to know how to do these problems just from the point of knowing some number theory. But a problem that takes a half hour of calculation, which you're almost guaranteed to get wrong because you make a mistake in arithmetic along the way, is not a proper uh, final exam problem. And for the same reason, I think I can't give you 
a problem to ask you to prove that a particular number is a Carmichael number, because this also requires an hour of calculation. It's the very important problems, but I can't do it on a final exam where you only have two hours. That's good to know. Thank you, Professor. <coughs> the thing is, though, it's just quite interesting that from the point of view of applications of number theory to um, the what you might call the real world, business and government and military, um, this is this part, this little bit on pseudo primes, Carmichael numbers, uh, and the RSA crypto system is really very important. It made a fundamental, have fundamental effect on how the world operates. Just the way in biology today, um, the discovery of mRNA viruses that are used to make, for example, the COVID vaccine is a fundamental change in the way medicine will be handled for the next generation or two. But as with many of these things, I mean, these are very important problems in number theory, but I can't put anything about a Carmichael number on the final exam, because if this were a take-home exam, uh, it would be different, but not on an exam, which is a two-hour exam. Perfect. Other questions? Can you do, Professor, can you do please number 33? I'll try. I'll try. Thank you. By the way, uh, let's see. Remember the um, final exam is a week from today. And I will probably have an office hour every single day until the final exam including over the weekend. I'll make sure I have office hours Saturday and Sunday of this week as well. So you can always, there's always at least one time every day when you can log on and ask questions. And I try to have some in the, of the out office hour type uh, Zoom sessions in the morning, the afternoon and the evening because people have different work schedules. Okay. Um, Professor. Yeah. Can you please record the office hours? Sorry? Can record I record the office, office hours? hours? Yes. Uh, I'll try to remember. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to remember. If you, yeah. <laughs> so maybe anyone who logs into an office hour, just remind me I should be recording it. Uh, the thing is, the office hours are for any of my classes. So it could be, um, you know, calculus or linear programming, and it's all often mixed together. Um, but I'll try to remember to record. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, you asked me to do which problem? Someone just asked me. To 33. 33. 23? Or 33? I'm, I'm sorry. My sound is sort of garbled. 33. Number 33. Okay, sorry. Solve the quadratic congruence x squared plus 20x plus 89 congruent to zero mod 53. So you can set this up in different ways. You could say, for example, x squared plus 20x congruent to minus 89 mod 53, I just brought this to the other side. And I might want to complete the square, which I can do by adding 100 to both sides. So this is also true. And x squared plus 20x plus 100 is exactly x plus 10 squared. So I want to know x plus 10 squared congruent to 11 mod 53. Can I solve this congruence? So this has a solution. If and only if 11 is a quadratic residue mod 53. So, so actually, there, 
Um, yeah. So maybe before I look for a solution, I should try and see if there is a solution. Now, actually, I can tell by looking right away that there's a solution. But let me just calculate this in any case. 11 over 53. So these are both primes. 11 is 3 mod 4, and 53 is 1 mod 4. So because at least one of these two prime numbers is 1 mod 4, I can turn this over by quadratic reciprocity. This is 53 over 11. 53 is the same as minus 2 with respect to 11, which is minus 1 over 11 times 2 over 11. 11 is 3 mod 4. So this first Legendre symbol is minus 1. 11 is 5, sorry, 11 mod 8 is 3. three this, is, this is 3 mod 8. So 2 over 11 is also minus 1. So minus 1 times minus 1 is plus 1. So 11 is a quadratic residue. So this does have a solution. And of course, you might notice that 8 squared, I mean, is 64, which is congruent to 11 mod 53. So x plus 10 can be anything which is congruent to plus or minus 8 mod 53. So x is plus or minus 8 minus 10 mod 53. So this is either minus 2 mod 53 or minus 18 mod 53. Or if you don't like negative numbers, this is the same as 51 mod 53 or 35 mod 53. And again, you can just check if x is negative 2, this is 8, which is 64, which is 11. If x is minus 18, this is minus 8. When you square it, it's also 64. So this is definitely correct. Thank you. Sure. Professor, can you go over 36 or 37? 36? Yes. OK. So prove that n is divisible by 3. That means n is congruent to 0 mod 3, if and only if the sum of the decimal digits is congruent to 0 mod 3. So for example, if you take a random number like, I don't know, 786. 7 plus 8 plus 6, that's the sum of the digits, is 21, is congruent to 0 mod 3. So by this theorem, this implies 786 is congruent to 0 mod 3. And so this is a very convenient way to tell quickly whether a number is divisible by D. And the proof is based on the following. So you have to understand decimal notation. So for example, 786, what does this mean? This is, if I worked it, write it back, or it doesn't matter how, what order I write in, this is like six plus 80, 
plus 700, right? That's what this means. This is six times 10 to the zero, eight times 10 to the first power and seven times 10 squared. Now, 10 is congruent to one mod three. So any power of 10, 10 to the K is congruent to one to the K, which is also one mod three. So if I write the number like this, including 10 to the zero, 10 to the zero is one. So it's congruent to one mod three also. So any non-negative power. So this is congruent mod three to six times one plus eight times one plus seven times one, which is six plus eight plus seven mod three, the sum of the digits. So in general, if you have a positive integer n, suppose n, when you write it as digits, it's like um, a k, I'll write dk, dk minus one, d one, d zero. This is the, these are the decimal digits of n, right? Like n equals, what was this last example? 786. So this is the D zero, this is D one, this is D two. And what this means is DK times 10 to the K plus DK minus one times 10 to the K minus one plus D one times 10 plus D zero. And every power of 10 is congruent to one mod three. So this is congruent to dk plus dk minus one plus d1 plus d0 mod three. So that's what we had to prove. In fact, it actually proves something stronger. It proves that n is congruent mod three to whatever the sum of the digits is. So if I take some number, eight, nine, two, six, five, one, one, three, seven, all right? That's my n. So mod three, this is congruent to eight plus nine plus two plus six plus five plus one plus one plus three plus seven. What is this number? 17, 19, 25, 30, 31, 32, 35, 42, it's congruent to 42 mod three. Of course, this is also congruent to the sum of its digits. This is congruent to four plus two or congruent to six mod three, which is zero. So this number is zero mod three. And Problem 37 is essentially the same thing because we also know ten is congruent to one, not just mod three, it's also congruent to one mod nine. So ten to the k is congruent to one mod nine for all k. So if I have a number, like, what was the strange number I just looked at? N equals eight, nine, two, six, five, one, one, three, seven. Mod nine, this is congruent to eight plus nine plus two plus six plus five plus one plus one plus three plus seven mod nine which I, uh, I added it up, I got 42 mod nine. That's congruent to six mod nine. So N is not divisible by nine. N is not zero mod nine, N is six mod nine. 
Right? And again, the proof is exactly the same as the proof we used a moment ago. If this is the decimal representation of n, this means n is a sum of dk times 10 to the k, dk minus 1, 10 to the k minus 1, and so forth. This is also equal to the sum of the digits mod 9. And that's the proof. So they often teach this to kids in elementary school. They don't prove it exactly, but they it's called throwing out uh, nines. That's an easy way to tell if a number is divisible by nine. You just add the digits. And of course, if, they, if, if the number you get by adding the digits is still pretty big, you add the digits of that number and you iterate the process and you very quickly get a very small number. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Sure. Can you go over the next one, 38, please? Oh, I'm not going to do Carmichael numbers because I'm not going to put it on the exam. Because it takes okay, way too great. long to calculate. Um, Thank you. So it's an important subject in number theory, but uh, I, I can't do it on the exam. And if I did a problem like that right now, it would take 45 minutes. They, I mean, they use a lot of number theory. They're very nice problems, but they're time consuming. Let me do number uh, 34 and 35. Yeah, that's a good thing to review. So 34, let's say that A, or let's say G, is a primitive root modulo a prime number P. If, first of all, G and P are relatively prime, and you can say this in several equivalent ways. One is, uh, G has order P minus one modulo P. That is the smallest power of G, which is congruent to one mod P, the smallest positive power is P minus one. Or equivalently, if A and P are relatively prime, then there always exists K such that A is congruent to G to the K mod P. And K is called the index of A. With respect to the primitive root G. So we want to prove that two is a primitive root mod 11. If I take G equal to two is a primitive root mod 11. So we know that by Fermat's theorem, g to the 10th, sorry, two to the 10th is congruent to one mod 11. And the order of two modulo 11 is a divisor of 10, that is, one, two, five, or 10. So if the order of two is not one, two, or five, then it has to be 10. So two to the first power is congruent to two is not one mod 11. Two squared, which is four, is not one mod 11. 
2 to the fifth, which is 32, is minus 1, so it's not 1, mod 11. So therefore, 2 is a primitive root. That's one way to do it. Um, So this was part B. Part C is prove three is not a primitive root, mod 11. Well, again, we have to take the powers of three. Three to the first power is three, which is not one, mod 11. Three squared is nine, which is not one mod 11. Three to the fifth power. What is three to the fifth power? Three, nine, 27, 81, 243. If you divide 243 by 11, well, actually, a, this is 11. times two plus one, right? No, sorry, 11 times 22 uh, plus one. So this is congruent to one mod 11. So three has order five mod 11, not order 10. So three is not a primitive root modulo 11. Right. Any questions about this? This is the type of problem that you have to be able to do on the final exam. This is really sort of fundamental arithmetic number theory. So in part B, we prove that two is a primitive root mod 11. So every number is a power of two mod 11, and that's just divisible by 11. So in number 35, we want to compute the index of five. Modulo 11 with respect to the primitive root two. So that is we want to find the least positive integer k such that two to the k is congruent to five mod 11. So you can just, if you want to start taking powers of two, two to the first power is two mod 11, two squared is four, two cubed is eight, mod 11, two to the fourth power is 16, which is congruent to five, mod 11. So the index of five with respect to this primitive root two is equal to four. Any questions about this? So number 30 was to define the Legendre symbol and state Gauss's law of quadratic reciprocity. That's all written down, but then we had to use the law of quadratic reciprocity to determine if minus 70 is a quadratic residue mod 137. 
So we want to calculate this Legendre symbol. 137 is a prime, but 70 is not. So the first thing we have to do is factor the numerator. This is minus one and 70 is two times five times seven. And then we use the multiplicativity of the Legendre symbol. This is minus one over 137, two over 137, five over 137, and seven over 137. Now, 137 is congruent to one mod four. So minus one over 137 is plus one. And 137 if you divide it by 8 it's also congruent to 1 mod 8 so 2 is a quadratic residue modulo 137 so these are both equal to plus 1 i can cancel them i don't i mean they're just plus 1 so i need to know i need to calculate these two legendre symbols so five over 137, five is one mod four. So this is 137 over five. 137 is congruent to two mod five. And two is not a quadratic residue mod five. So this is minus one. Seven is three mod four, but again, 137 is one mod four. So I can write, flip this over. What is 137 mod seven? It's four. Because 137 minus four is 133 and seven divides into 133 exactly 19 times. And four is a square, so this is plus one. So minus 70 over 137 is one times one times minus one times one is minus one. So minus okay. 70 is not a quadratic residue modulo 137. Professor. Yeah. It's not easier to say that negative 70 is just 67 more mod 137 and then just do reciprocity. So you can also do it like that, absolutely. So you could say minus 70 over 137, minus 70 is the same as 67 over 137. 67 is a prime. 67 is congruent to three mod four, but 137 is one mod four. So this is 137 over 67. 137 mod 67 is congruent to um, three, I believe, All right? Yeah, that's correct. And 67 is three mod four, so and this is three mod four, so this is minus 67 over three, and 67 is the same as one mod three, so you get minus one. So this is also a perfectly good way to do the problem. And this is easier and quicker. This gives you a little bit more practice with quadratic reciprocity but they're both correct and they both give you the right answer, which is minus one. Other questions? 
And we <laughs> practice a little bit 26 or 27. Okay. Maybe like 26A and 27A, like one of each. So number 26 is to determine if there's solutions to the congruence 13X congruent to five mod 37. So, uh, so of course we know this has a solution. If and only if five is congruent to zero modulo the greatest common divisor of 13 and 37, which is one. So this does have a solution and it has a unique solution mod 37. So how can we find it? Well, there's always sort of trial and error or we could try and make this a little bit simpler because let's see, 13, um, well, if you don't, there's always one way that always works, which is, you see, this means um, three X is congruent to five mod 37, if and only if there exists a Y such that 13X minus five is 37Y or equivalently 13X minus 37Y equals five. So you wanna find a solution to this Diophantine equation. And what you always know is that by the Euclidean algorithm, You can always find, let's say, X naught and Y naught such that 13 X naught minus 17 Y minus 37 Y naught is one, right? Because these are relatively prime. And then you could just multiply this equation by five. So let's do it. Let's, let's use the Euclidean algorithm. You, you apply the Euclidean algorithm to 37 and 13. So 37 is two times 13 plus 11. And 13 is one times 11 plus two. And 11 is five times two plus one. So I got my one as a remainder. So one, is 11 minus five times two, which is 11 minus five and two is 13 minus 11. So this is six times 11 minus five times 13. And 11 is 37 minus two times 13 minus five times 13. So this is six times 37 minus 12 times 13 minus, minus 17 times 13. So I have this representation of one as an integral linear combination of 37 and 13. So if I multiply by five, five is 30 times 37, five times 17 minus 85 times 13. So this says that if I take X equal to 85, this is just one solution, not necessarily a great one, but uh, this says that 13 
times 85 13 times minus 85 is congruent to 5 mod 37. So I could take x equal to minus 85. Now, of course, 37, 74, this is the same as minus 11. So 13 times minus 11 is congruent to 5 mod 37. Or if you prefer positive numbers, 13 times 36 is congruent to five mod 37. So I could take X congruent to 36. Oops, something doesn't look right. Uh, 36 or 26? 26, thank you. X congruent to 26 mod 37. So that's one way to find the solution. The Euclidean algorithm will always work. I mean, sometimes you can just look and see a solution, but this looks a little bit more complicated. So this was 26A. And maybe I'll just squeeze in the corner here 26b was to find a solution if there is any of 20, 12x congruent to 7 mod 33. But the greatest common divisor of 12 and 33 is 3, and 7 is not congruent to 3, not congruent to um, 0 mod 3. So there's no solution to this congruence. So for B, 12X congruent to seven mod 33, the basic theorem about the solutions of a linear congruence tells us there's no solution. So you don't need to spend your time looking for one. Okay. Let me do number 27. So this is the Chinese remainder theorem. X congruent to A mod M, X congruent to B mod N, this system has a solution if and only if A is congruent to B modulo the greatest common divisor of the two moduli M and N. And the solution is unique that is one congruence class modulo the least common divisor of M and N. So in A, we have the pair of congruences X congruent to nine mod 14, X congruent to 23 modulo 35, the greatest common divisor of 14 and 35 this is seven times two and seven times five is seven, just as the greatest, the least common multiple of 14 
and 35 is 70. And nine is congruent to 23 mod seven. So this means that solutions exist. And one way to find it is the following. If X is congruent to nine mod 14, that means that X is a number of the form nine plus 14 Y. It's a number congruent to nine mod 14. And if X is also congruent to 23 mod 35, this means 14 Y is congruent to 23 minus nine is congruent to 14 mod 35, which obviously has a solution one. Um, you can also say this is the same as if I divide each of these by seven, y is congruent to one mod five. So the solutions of this, sorry, two y is congruent to two mod five, which means y is congruent to one mod five. So y is a number that form one plus five z and x is nine plus 14y, that's nine plus 14, one plus five z, nine and 14 is 23. Huh. Plus 70z. So if I let x be any number congruent to 23, this is certainly a solution of this, it's also a solution of this. So this is the general solution. So the general solution is all X congruent to 23 mod 70. Any questions about that? In 27b, when you apply the Chinese remainder theorem, you'll see that there's no solution. So whenever 27b, we have the pair of congruences, x congruent to 16 mod 28, X congruent to 22 mod 36. The greatest common divisor of 28 and 36 is four and 16 is not congruent to 22 mod four. So no solution to the system of congruences. Professor. Yeah. Can we go over 22? Sorry, which? 22. 22. Yes. Okay. So we want to find, use the Euclidean algorithm to find the greatest common divisor of 290 and 47. So you want to divide 47 into 200 and 90, and this goes um, six times. So six times 47 
is 42, it's 282, and it leaves a remainder of eight. Is that right? Yes. And 47, when you divide it by eight, the quotient is, um, five and it leaves a remainder of seven and eight when you divide it by seven leaves a remainder of one so one is eight minus seven seven is 47 minus eight times five so this is eight plus six times plus five times eight that's six times eight minus 47 and eight is 290 minus 47 times six minus 47. This is six times 209, so sorry. So for the first part, this says that, you, so for A, this says that um, the GCD of 290 and 47 is one. And then to express that as a linear combination, you go through this algorithm. This is six times 290 minus 36 times 47 minus 47 is minus 37 times 47. So this is one expressed as a linear combination of 290 and 47. And so this is part B. And in part C, 290 over 47 is six plus eight over 47, just dividing this equation by 47, which is six plus one over 47 over eight by fractions. Six plus one over 47 over eight is five plus seven over eight which is six plus one over five plus one over eight over seven, which is six plus one over five plus one over one plus one over seven. So, So this is the continued fraction for 290. Over 47. Six, one, sorry, six, five, one, seven. Uh, normally you would also put another line here, divide seven by one. Seven is one times seven plus the remainder of zero. So, these are the quotients that come up in the Euclidean algorithm, 6517, exactly the numbers that you see in the continued fraction. Yeah, that's 22. Any other questions? Professor, just uh, a quick question about the final. How many questions are you thinking? I have no idea. <laughs> um, probably not <clears throat> too much different from the midterm. Okay. Because, you know, in both cases, you only have two hours. So it can't be a lot of questions. Right. 
And then the final will be out of 40 points. Is that right? Uh, whatever I had said originally, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. So there are a lot of extra points built into the grading for the semester. Anything else? Uh, again, every day there's an office hour and you're welcome to log in. And um, if no one logs in after 20 minutes or a half an hour, I just you know close it down. But uh, if people log in, I'm usually willing to run over an hour unless I have a class or something else. But, um, but there is an office hour every day. So up until the final. Okay, then Professor. we are done for the day. Uh, Professor. Yes, sir. I have a really quick question. So I have, I have an issue with the homework numbers. It looks like I submitted the homeworks in the wrong, wrong spot because I am doing the last homework. There is still three more homeworks to, to submit. Uh, like if I notice that I'm missing one homework, it's okay that I, if I submitted in the remaining three? Uh, yes, you can turn in the homeworks and correct anything up until the day when I give the final, which is a week yeah. from today. But what I mean is, like, since I have the numbers wrong, like, for example, if I submit homework, I'm missing homework six and I submit in homework 20, it's, it's okay because I, I submit in the wrong spots. Right. So you can resubmit it and just, you know, there's a place where you can put in a note to me and just okay. explain what you're doing. Ah, okay. Perfect. I appreciate fine. it. Okay, perfect. Have a good day. Thank you, you too. All right, everyone. Take well, be well. Good luck on all your exams. Thank, thank, thank you, Professor. Professor. Have a good day. Thank you, Bye -bye. Professor.